No, we're recording. So I can edit it out. Hey, pastor down. It was not uh, uh, mid set prayer. Oh, okay. Call me. Everybody, chance to. Yeah. So call me. Yeah. So you're aware? Oh yeah, she was just so thrilled. I always forget to do that. Always. Oh, I left my order of service. I think he just likes to go for one. Oh, he didn't. Oh, we got Exactly. So, this guy can edit, I can... Uh, and I've got a shotgun mic on board that sits on top. Yeah. <laughs> we have the hardware, we have the software problem. We just gotta get people sorted out. So I'm gonna give Jack a call, we'll do the live conference, I can move my phone around, he can show me. But this is much tighter and crisper and you know what? Yeah, it's just so much better. Well, and I know that our friends are talking about the state of the mission. That's what they, like, they are being played this year. And that's exactly what they're doing. And who are these people? And that's what they're doing. 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 And that's what they're Okay, I'm sitting. I'm done. I'm done. I'm Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I greet you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as we gather together to worship on this. I I don't know enough. Is this good rain? Bad rain? Done? Study? Murray? Just right. Just right? Sure. Okay, we'll go with Murray. Just right. It's, it's the Goldilocks stage, right? It's not too hot. It's not too cold. It's just right. Mid-20s is Goldilocks, so... Well, we are a praying people, so let's begin by prayer. I ask you to uh, look around the room, and as the Spirit grabs your attention, take a moment and pray for that person. Father, we gather this morning, each one of us has family and life and personal issues that perhaps no one even knows about. Things that have happened this week that we haven't been able to share with anyone. And yet you are present in those moments. You are present in the deepest, darkest sorrows. And you're there when the sun is shining and we are enjoying the good things of life. But always you are with us. And I was reminded this week again that it is your joy with us, not our joy. You are with us this morning, and that gives us cause for joy. Your presence in our midst through all circumstances, that we are to rejoice in you. So this morning, as we worship in song, as we share the Lord's table, as we hear the word, each part would bring us a measure of your presence, a measure of your joy. Fill us afresh with your spirit this morning, I pray. In all these good things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship through songs. <laughs> Good morning, folks. Good to see you here. As I'm sure is no mystery to any of you here, this is a pretty 
pretty darn busy time of year. Everybody's kind of right in the midst of just chaos. And there's one different for us this week. We uh, like to always have a midweek practice. And that didn't happen, so this morning was a little, <laughs> a little fresh. But um, I'm glad in knowing that we're not up here to put on a show for you, and it doesn't need to be spit polished and perfect. <laughs> Case in point. But we are here to do <laughs> the job of leading you good people in worship through music without being a distraction that we can bring into place that is honoring and glorifying to God through our songs, through our words, and through what we do. So that is our goal. Having said that, <laughs> please extend us some grace if we, if we stumble, but our job here is to worship and lead you into worship and worship with you as a, as a church. So having said that, um, please stand with us as we worship together. <laughs>
all be working together. Uh, so hopefully, I know she's been handing those out. Get those back to us as soon as you can. But Adult Study School, 945, thank you. I want to hear that in harmony with the three of you. But, uh, <laughs> 945, this week, uh, prayer meeting will be at 7, and then Bible study at 7.30. So we're back in our rhythm again, uh, our, kind of our somewhat fall routine. So, Bible study, 7.30, prayer meeting, 7. Adult Sunday school at 9.45. 9.45. Perfect. <laughs> and then youth Sunday school will start the first week in October. I think that's, is that clear? Makes sense? Good. Good. And we'll post that and continue. Now that, uh, Peter's got some tests coming up. We want to continue to pray for him as well. As well as parents send their kids off to school and kids send themselves off to school. And some are doing it online. And some university students are doing their first year at home. And uh, online education can be a real challenge. So we have a few things to pray for as well. Harvest continues. So uh, Also, Dales are moved to their new place. So your back's in one piece. Look, still keep. So far, so, far, so good. Good. All right. That's fine. Father, you remind us that all that we need for life and godliness is found in you. We come to you, the source of all that we need. When we are weary, you are our strength. When we're worried, you are our peace. When we're concerned about tomorrow, you are the one who holds tomorrow in your hand. In these days to come, as we think about uh, tomorrow, about back to school, back to work, all those facets of the unknown, we commit them to you. You who are there present already for time and space belong to you. But we do pray this week for parents sending their kids off to school, especially for those little ones whose first year of school and just all so much. We pray for teachers and administrators, for custodians and for special care heads, each one who is involved in starting this fresh new year. We pray for wisdom for them, creativity as they embrace what's to come. We pray for those in our care centers who are feeling distant, disconnected from family members, for administrators and care aides as they work in that environment, for each one, that they would be agents of peace, authors of joy in those places, but also those who would watch over and protect. We pray for those who are in the field these days as the weeks continue. We've got a little bit of splash of rain that is from your hand. But pray for peace for them and strength, watch over them, keep them from harm. And Father, once again, bless us with harvest as you have time and time again. We thank you for the good fruit that is upon our tables that comes from your good hand. We pray for our brother Peter, for the ongoing challenges he is facing. Father, we ask that you would strengthen his body, his mind. Father, give him the peace of your presence in each and every moment. Father, for unspoken requests that are here, for marriages and families. Father, for grandparents who are far from their grandchildren, and grandchildren who are far and want, just want to be around and grandpa and grandma again. For each and every one. Father, we commit them to you now. Father, grant us grace and strength during this season, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us again as we continue to worship.
as they go off. And I don't think they really do social distancing real well when you're three. <laughs> but, uh, that's crazy. Father, we think of our little, littlest little ones. Parents who are going back to work and looking for a safe place that loves and cares for the little ones as well. And as daycares and play schools all begin afresh again, as little ones get dropped off with uncertainty and there's changes. We pray for parents that they would feel safe knowing their kids are well loved and well cared for. We pray for each one who organizes, administers, cleans, and tries to navigate what it means in the days to come. Pray for wisdom for them. We thank you our little ones are safe. And we commit them all to you in this moment in Jesus' name. So just before we go to the message, um, we, once a month we have a Zoom conference with our district uh, uh, superintendent, and he meets with the province, the uh, team that's organizing and doing this stuff. And the province said to him, we're not used to churches because you're really nimble and you change on the fly. We like institutions. Uh, they're not. And he said, so churches are very nimble. And so we had this discussion that although you can't sing without a mask, one of the things you're allowed to do is you're allowed to read out loud because it's the same as speech. I don't want to do the science. So that means we can do responsive readings in church. Okay. So grab your hymnal, which has been sanitized for you. <laughs> Turn to page 634 or responsive reading 659. This may be a gray area, but I'm going to be nimble this morning. 634, uh, responsive reading 659. This is the very first one. And out of reverence for God's word, I ask you to stand with me. I'm going to read the bold print. And if you, without moist speech, <laughs> would read the italicized print. Let's hear one another's voices for the first time in a while. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Comfort us in the that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation, and our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye also be a consolation. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Amen. It's nice to hear you. Those who study such things tell us that the an average adult makes about 35,000 remotely conscious decisions every day, in contrast to a child that makes about 3,000. Now, we have to define remotely conscious decisions fairly clear there. For example, if you type a text, every letter you choose is considered a conscious decision and a space or whatever. So if you type, hey, hi, honey, could you pick up milk on the way home? That's just over 50 decisions. So that's why when they say 35 conscious decisions, they're, it's pretty broad. Think about every step you take. That's a remotely conscious decision on multiple levels, especially some of you maybe have fallen recently, and you understand that the importance of that decision-making process. So we make all these complex decisions, constantly deciding what to do, where to go, and how to respond. And especially in the face of the unknown, that decision process 
We can't rely on the old decisions, we have to make new decisions. So if you want to know how complex the decision-making process is, just go to the city with three other people and try and decide where to stop for lunch. <laughs> you will know how complex, especially if they're two middle children, they can't make that decision. They, they, they'll freeze in the process. Don and I were deciding what to watch on Netflix last night, and I looked it up. There are 3,800 movies to choose from. We froze, because we could not make a decision. We said, oh, we'll just watch the same thing we watched you know, over and over again, right? That decision-making process. So what are the tools you and I use to make decisions? Well, sometimes it's just impulsiveness. You're standing in front of, you know, at McDonald's, like, uh, a burger. Like, if that's just impulse, right? Sometimes it's compliance. Uh, we go along with what the other people are saying. Oh, I'll just go along. What do you want? Whatever you say is fine with me. Sometimes we delegate. We say, you make the decision this time. That's the delegation of decision making. Sometimes we just avoid the process altogether. We choose not to make a decision, which is a decision. If you choose not to do anything, that's a decision. Sometimes we balance our factors. We sit and say, okay, we did this last time. You got to choose, and we might balance out the forces. Sometimes we'll defer to our core values, and we'll say, because I value X, Y, and Z, I will choose the next choice, right? It's based on your values. Sometimes it's just our history. Uh, sometimes it's our experience. In other words, we have all these sets of tools we use every day to make all these decisions that we are forced to make every day. Some decisions are based on what we choose not to do. Some are based on what we choose to do. But, what if? What if there was a better tool than impulse, or deflection, or deference, or history, or, or our behaviors from the past? What if there was a really good tool that God had given us in order to make good decisions? And what if 8% of the Bible was dedicated to that tool. What if we ignored 8% of the Bible and that tool? What decisions would we make? What if God gave us a better way to make good decisions and repeatedly in His Word, time and again, He equipped us with that tool to make those decisions? Welcome to wisdom. See, God has said, if when you're going to make these decisions, I will give you, that's why James says, let the one who lacks wisdom pray. Because well, God wants to give you wisdom so that you can make decisions every day. I was meeting with a senior one time, and we were talking about some of the developmental changes, and what happens, like it or not, as we get older, we have some frontal atrophy, low issues. You know, it starts to change a little bit. And this is the part of your brain that makes decisions. And she said, oh, no, I make good decisions every day. And I said, then tell me why when you were carrying your groceries, you thought you could make it down the stairs. She said, well, I just, I said, that's a decision-making process that is having an effect, right? Well, what if God said, you don't, you don't have to rely on these things no matter how old you are, for I will grant you wisdom. And as a matter of fact, the older you get, the more wisdom you get. Isn't that an interesting offset? Wisdom. Five of the 66 books of the Bible are called wisdom books. And this fall, we're going to be looking at three of those books. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. We're going to spend the bulk of our time in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and then a very limited amount of time to Song of Songs, which is a book in Jewish tradition. You have to be over 13 to read. So the other two are Job and Psalms, and they deserve uh, a separate study. But before we begin to look at the book of Proverbs this fall, I want to look at wisdom itself through three different lenses, kind of a trifocal approach. First is this, let's take a look at wisdom through culture. And how does our culture view this concept of wisdom? Well, this is the work of Dr. Neil Burton, who was an MD and he wrote in Psychology Today in November of 2018. Here's what he writes, fascinating. In an age dominated by science and technology, by specialization and compartmentalization, wisdom is too loose, too grand, and too mysterious a concept. With our heads in our smartphones and tablets, in our bills and bank statements, we simply don't have time or mental space for wisdom. Yet while many things can lengthen your life, only wisdom can save it. 
The word philosophy that we toss around literally means the love of wisdom. Philo is love and Sophia is wisdom. It means to love wisdom. The Greeks loved wisdom. They had Athena. Anybody know what her animal was? Anybody know what Athena's animal was? The owl. That's why we think of owls with wisdom. And it was regarded as the symbol of wisdom because it flew and hunted in the darkness. And it could find truth in the midst of the darkness. In Norse mythology, those of you who watch the Marvel movies with Odin, you'll notice he's got a patch on one eye. That's not because he you know, left his coffee cup with his spoon in it, you know, right that way. It's because he gouged out one of his eyes and offered it to Mimri in exchange for a drink from the well of wisdom. In a sense, he traded one form of perception for another. And the theory is that Odin, of course, was wise, the wisest of all the gods. Our very name of our species, Homo sapiens, is literally wise man. We are to be wise, setting us apart from the animals. He continues. Wisdom is understanding cause and consequence. Understanding what caused it and the consequences of the decision you're about to make. Wisdom understands the why it happened and the what now of the decision. What caused it and what will happen next. It's the understanding of the relationship between things and the effects of the decisions upon those relationships. Wisdom is cause and consequence. You know why this happened, and then you make a decision, you say, in light of the consequences of those actions. So that's wisdom in a summary statement from our culture. And the second lens we want to look at is wisdom in Judaism, the roots of our faith. Fascinating. In the Talmud, it says that you are not wise until you're 60. Now that leaves some of us a ways to go, and some of us just crossed that threshold recently. But only those who are over 60 are considered wise. Uh, the word zaken is literally the word old in Hebrew. And it's an acronym for the three words z, kana, and shma, which literally means the one who has acquired wisdom. So if you are older this morning, over 60, you are wise by virtue of your age. And at one level within Judaism, wisdom is intelligence or shrewdness. But it also can imply good sense and sound judgment, this moral understanding, as Proverbs says, a clever man's wisdom makes him behave intelligently. At the third level, wisdom is the individual who considers the profound problems of human existence, life, and destiny. So this idea that the wise person is one who is intelligent, who's shrewd, who makes good decisions, and who understands the very nature of life. Wisdom is the fruit of the unending quest for the meaning of life. And so Job writes, Where shall wisdom be found? Man does not know the way to it. It is hidden from the eyes of all living things. God understands the way to it. Within Judaism, wisdom is in part the quest for meaning that only God can provide, for He alone can give us wisdom. A wise person understands the meaning of life, for they are connected and they hear from God. So those are kind of two lenses, the, the secular philosophy and then the roots of Judaism. But let's take a look in Scripture this morning. Within the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, if you wanted peace, you had to pursue wisdom. For wisdom would give the fruit of peace. Wisdom is the path to peace and ultimately to prosperity with it. This wisdom that leads to peace is to be sought after like gold and silver. And we'll see that in Proverbs. It is to be pursued with all of life's value. A prize to be pursued. Wisdom is the way, the, the path that leads us to God. That allows the soul to bless, be blessed and to find hope upon God's holy hill. To those who seek life, they must seek wisdom first, for in finding wisdom they'll find life. These are verses we'll see time and again as we study Proverbs. And we'll see as we pursue it, and we move through Proverbs, that wisdom is described like a woman to be desired with great passion. But something interesting happens. Between the Old Covenant and as the New Covenant is revealed through Jesus, Wisdom takes a shift in tone, but not just tone, in identity. 
wisdom, this way of life, this path of peace, this entrance to the holy hill, this very thing that we are to pursue with all our being by the time we get into the New Testament is no longer an abstract idea, some grand philosophical scheme. Wisdom is no longer words, for the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, as John's gospel begins in chapter 1. Now within the new covenant, truth is now touchable. Wisdom can now be walked beside. No longer the realm of probability, wisdom is now a person. I think as we get older and as we lose our parents, that opportunity to seek their wisdom is lost. We miss the opportunity to phone up mom or phone up dad and, and get their thoughts and get their opinions on things. We have to make the decisions on our own. And we miss their wisdom. We miss their person. And this idea that wisdom is a person is born in the New Testament. This wisdom that was so eagerly sought is now born here in flesh. And there's a contrasting set of images between the wisdom as presented in the Old Covenant and the Torah and the books and presented in the New Testament. And the difference is the difference of a person. I want to read you a few verses. First, from some Old Testament books. And not just Old Testament books, but some of the books that went alongside. Uh, the Book of Wisdom of Solomon, they, they didn't quite land in the canon. But they're considered authoritative in their own nature. And then listen to the verses of the New Testament correspondingly. And see the shift from idea to person. This is from the book called The Wisdom of Solomon. This is 9-9. With God is wisdom, who knows your works and was present when you made the world. Wisdom was present when God made the world. Does that sound familiar? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and through Him all things came into being. Wisdom created all things. Proverbs 8.35 says, Whoso finds wisdom finds life. And what does Jesus say of Himself? I am the resurrection and the life. If you find wisdom, you find life. And Jesus says to find me is to find life. Jesus can constantly presents Himself to His audience as the very wisdom they had heard of and were seeking. In 1 Enoch 42.2, again a book not in the canon, it says this though, Wisdom went forth to make her dwelling among the children of men and found no dwelling place. <laughs> Sound familiar? He came unto his own and his own received him not. Foxes have their dens, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Syriac 24.8 says this, The one who created wisdom assigned a place for my tent. And he said, Make your dwelling in Jerusalem. Wisdom would dwell in Jerusalem. John 1.14, the word dwelt among us. One last one. The wisdom of Solomon 16.18 says this, And the love of wisdom is to keep her laws, and giving heed to her laws will give you eternal life. What does Jesus say? If you love me, you obey my commands. In me is eternal life. And so what we see is this shift from these Old Covenant ancient ideas of wisdom is presented in these books, and along comes Jesus, and Jesus says, that's me. Everything you read of, everything you sought like gold and silver, that's me. Jesus and the writers of the New Testament, as the Spirit spoke, said, this wisdom you pursue has come to pursue you and to find you. You who sought wisdom for so long is now actually seeking you. Jesus said, I am the wisdom you pursue, and I, like a shepherd looking for sheep, like a woman looking for lost coins, and like a father for lost sons, wisdom now seeks you. And as we turn to the rest of the New Testament, we see time and again that Jesus is wisdom. He was wise. Mark 6, 2, when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? Remember, Job said wisdom alone comes from God. They acknowledged that Jesus had wisdom given to him. Where did this man get the wisdom? And such miracles as performed by his hand. Not only were they astonished at the miraculous, they were astonished at his wisdom, for wisdom comes from God. 
Then Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit, acknowledges that Jesus himself is wisdom. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 with me. Let's read it. Starting in verse 20 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 30. We're just going to read four verses and then jump over to verse 30. But I want you to see for yourself in front of you as the Spirit speaks and tells us this great truth. Verse 20. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher, the one who loves wisdom of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom didn't know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. You get that? Christ is both the power of God and the wisdom of God. And what do the Jews just say? Who is this man that performs miracles and is so wise? Those two, signs and wisdom. Paul picks it up and says the Jews seek signs, the Greeks seek wisdom. Jesus was doing both in his lifetime. He was wisdom and he was power. And he says this Christ, he is the one who is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Wisdom personified, the living wisdom presented, rejected. We jump down to verse 30. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. Wisdom isn't something we internally possess. It's always a gift given. And wisdom came from God, and the word came from God, and wisdom dwelt. And so the Spirit writes through the Apostle Paul that Jesus has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Let me reinforce this one more time from Colossians chapter 2. I just want to read three verses. Colossians 2, starting in the first verse. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you, and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart, united in love, so that they may have the full riches and complete understanding in order that they may know the mysteries of God, namely Christ. For Christ is the complete understanding, the full riches, the mystery of God. Let's read verse 3. Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. See, Christ is wisdom. So we connect this with our first two lenses. It's one big ball. Right? Secular thinking is that wisdom is understanding cause and consequences. Within Jewish thinking, wisdom is for the ages who truly understand the meaning of life. Well, let's put Jesus up against those two lenses and see the light shine through him. Well, it only makes sense that Jesus would be wisdom. As creator, he is the cause of all things. As king, he is sovereign over the consequence of things. As the eternal one, he is eternally old, not old, but... And as the one in whom we live and move and have our being, he understands the meaning of all things. Jesus fulfills the criteria that psychology and our ancient faith has produced for us. It says, this is wisdom. We go, that's right. That's Jesus. The images you put, the ideas you create, the, the philosophy you have crafted, it fits. And Jesus is all those very things you seek. He is the one who understands the cause and the consequence. He is the ancient one who truly understands the meaning of all things. I want to read you two passages. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 1. Our little introduction this morning. And I want to read you the introduction of Proverbs. We're going to jump down to verse 20. And then I'm going to substitute one word and see how well it fits. Like two lenses perfectly aligning to give you clarity. Like when the optometrist goes, is this better? Click. Is this better? Click. And you get those two lenses. All right. Proverbs chapter 1, starting in verse 20. I'm going to read three verses. This is the image of the woman who is wise, the one to be desired. Verse 20. 
Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On the top of the wall, she cries out. At the city gate, she makes her speech. How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Repent at my rebuke. Then I will pour out my thoughts to you and I will make known to you my teachings. That's wisdom. Now let me change one word. Out in the open, Jesus calls aloud. He raises his voice in the public square. On the top of the wall, he cries out. At the city gate, he makes his speech. How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Repent at my rebuke. And I will pour out my thoughts to you. And I will make known to you my teaching. She says, come unto me, all you who are weary, all you who are foolish. Come and hear my teachings, and I will pour out my truth, my thoughts into you. You see, the woman of Proverbs, this woman personified as wisdom, really foreshadows, and in her own way, prophesy the coming of Jesus. For Jesus is wisdom. If you and I are to be wise, and boy, in this day and age, we need wisdom. If we are to walk in wisdom, to have wisdom be the guardian of our way to keep us from falling down the steps, as it were, then we must begin with the very foundation of wisdom. In the weeks and months to come, we'll explore the biblical teachings on what is wisdom, how to gain it, how it connects with the very facets of life. But for now, this morning, we must lay the foundation of wisdom. And it simply is this, is that wisdom is not an abstract concept you can learn in a book or even something you can learn in life because you and I have met people over 60 who aren't very wise. <laughs> so it's not simply a, a, a benefit of age or something that you learn by experience. It's something beyond that. You see, wisdom is not an abstract idea or a condition or something you can learn. Wisdom is a person. Wisdom. Is Jesus. I often think of it like satellite navigation or car navigation. You get in the car, you know, and you, you turn the navigation on, and she takes you for a drive, and oftentimes you end up where you didn't think you were going, and you think, I shouldn't really listen to her. We were driving this summer from Castle Butte, and I turned on the GPS to take me back to Assiniboia. She took us down highway. We're good. Turn left. The wood's getting narrower. Now we're down to just a single bird. I'm good. And then turned us on to gravel. I said, I can do gravel. Go down grass. She said, turn here. It was grass with two ruts. I said, I said you know, if this was me, I said, oh, she's right. I know. And, um, we'll get there. And then it's like she connected with the highway. I wasn't sure. You know what's even better than GPS? Letting someone else drive. We go to the city, what do we do? We say, Jack, you, you just drive. I'm going to sit in the back and rubberneck, and I can look around. You know? Isn't it better, rather than having a set of mechanisms and instructions, X, Y, Z, turn left, turn right, make this decision, don't make that decision. Here's the list. Wouldn't it be nicer to have someone in the car with us who drove? Jesus is in the car with us. We just have to let him make the decisions. Now that's a pretty abstract concept. But let me put some boots on the ground. See, for in the person of Jesus in our life, as we comply with his teachings, we will be wise. As we delegate decisions to him and pray and say, give me wisdom. As we value what he values. As we experience his truth. And we can take all those mechanisms that we saw in the first lens and we bring them over and we apply them to Jesus. Compliance, delegation, values, truth, and experience. As we surrender these to Jesus, then we are wise. As his values become our values. As his truth, we understand and we walk in obedience to him. Our message always comes down to this, beloved. It always comes down to Jesus. And these three lenses focus on Jesus this morning. You see, because as Christians, we don't follow Christianity. We follow Jesus. As Christians, we don't preach ourselves or our philosophies or something we read in a book. We preach Jesus and him crucified. We don't point people to say, come and share in our core values. 
We say, come and share in Jesus. Come to the cross. Over 300 years ago, a German pastor wrote a hymn built around the name of all names. And this is the English translation because my German doesn't exist. He writes this. Ask ye what great things I know that delights and stirs me so. What the high reward I win. Who's the name I glory in? Jesus, the crucified. This is the great thing I know. This delights and stirs me so. Faith in him who died to save his who triumphed o'er the grave, Jesus Christ, the crucified. Wisdom is Jesus. And in him we live and move and have our being in his wisdom. And because of that, the foundation of wisdom is rooted in him. We find ourselves once again at his table. Take your little cup. with us this morning as we once again recognize and celebrate Christ the crucified, the one who is risen. celebrate this morning. And that's why the Spirit writes to the Apostle Paul, for I received this from the Lord, and I gave it to you, that Jesus, the night he was betrayed, he took a piece of bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. Let's give thanks. Father, I'm so glad that I don't have to be smart. I don't have to be wise in myself. So glad that we as a church don't have to rest on our history, our experience, on the things that we try and cobble together. That we rest on the solid rock. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Boy, around us we've seen the sand sink. Some of the decisions we've seen in government, we wonder about how firm the sand even is. But we come this morning once again to the solid rock, who was betrayed crucified for our lives. We take this bread, this picture of his body, and we give thanks. To you this morning, Jesus says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. Father, I confess that in my own life, a lot of decisions I've made have not been wise. Matter of fact, they've been sinful. It led me to places where life didn't occur and growth didn't happen. I know each one of us, as we examine our own hearts this morning, recognize that. Our path has not always been the wise one, the right one, the pure one, the holy one the truthful one. <clears throat> Matter of fact, rather than the fruit of the Spirit, we have sought the garbage of sin. And it's only by your blood that we can be forgiven. It's only by your blood that we can be in a place where we are right with you. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. These are Jesus' words to you this morning. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
We do this for many reasons. But Paul reminds us of one substantial reason why we do this. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until it comes. We prepare ourselves for his coming as we proclaim his death through the cup. Let's close this song. forever.